Hey everyone, just before we start the show, we just wanted to drop in and quickly let you know about a little bit of a fun thing we're doing uh, this Saturday night, the 4th of September at 9pm Melbourne time. Our friend and editor John from Jersey, Joyzy, so I might have got that from. No, you nailed it. No, okay, great. Uh, he put together a video, uh, edited together a video of us when we toured the UK and Ireland in 2019. Where, back when we thought we'd be doing that all the time, just another trip. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't been allowed to leave the country since. Um, so It was that bad. <laughs> <laughs> they will not let us out again. You will want to see this video. You'll see why we, these three bad boys are not allowed to leave the country. Honestly, it's the feel-good hit of the summer. You guys are going to love it. Um, yeah, so we'll be in there chatting along uh with you if you want to get involved uh it's youtube.com slash doing on pod we'll have a, a link to the specific video on the show notes it's 9 p.m melbourne time i think that's midday in london and uh yeah you should be able to figure it out what time well. is it in joycey uh joycey i think it might be something pretty early in the morning i <laughs> yeah. think it might be like <laughs> 7 a.m or something i'm not Anyway, um, the other thing maybe while I've got people I could tell you about is uh, on the 11th of September, same time, 9pm, uh, it's the following Saturday, Primates uh, is doing a, a live episode online where we're getting together the Ape Titty Slide Boys uh, and we're delving further in the, into this investigation. I'm wow. sure most listeners will already be up to, <laughs> up to date with the Ape Titty Slide saga. <laughs> Wildly, we thought it was going to be one quick 20-minute episode to help plug my Brisbane live shows, and it is now going into its fourth full-hour episode. (laughs) And we genuinely keep blowing this case wide open. It's wild. Anyway, you can check that out. There'll be a link to that in the show notes as well. But anyway, shall we get on with the show? Yeah. Yeah. Welcome to another episode of Do Go On. My name is Dave Warnicke, and as always, I'm here with Matt Stewart and Jess Perkins. Hello, Dave. Howdy, Dave. Good to see you. You too. Jessica? Nice save, but it was not enough. <laughs> <laughs> now, what we do here is uh, one of the three of us each week goes away and does some research on a topic, brings it back to the other two, often suggested by a listener the topic is... And uh, to get on to topic, because the other two people have no idea what it's going to be, we always start with a question. And Jess, what is your question for Matt and I? Ethology is the study of what? Ethol. Okay. The ether. Okay. Both incorrect. Oh. So now Eth- you both get another go. <laughs> the racehorse ethereal who won the Melbourne Cup about 15 years ago. Also, funnily enough, incorrect. <laughs> um, oh. Oh. The earth. It is not the earth. Uh, your mum's butt. Uh, it is not the study of my mum's butt. It is <laughs> what about my mum? Oh, getting close. Oh, okay. <laughs> not at all. Um, okay. Uh, okay. What lives on the earth? People. Ooh. People and trees. Trees, plants, trees biscuits, and plants and biscuits and what else is alive? Animals. 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 The study of animals. It's the study of animal behaviour. Oh. Yes, you didn't let me finish. <laughs> and who comes to mind when you think about someone studying animal behaviour? David Attenborough. Oh, we've already done David Attenborough. <laughs> Not David Honestly, Attenborough. Honestly, it was David Attenborough. <laughs> is it... Uh, uh, Gorillas in the Mist. It is not Gorillas in the Mist. It's in a similar kind of wheelhouse. Jane Goodall. Jane Goodall. Oh. <laughs> this is back-to-back primates crossover episodes. <laughs> Last week we did Sea Monkeys. Yeah. This week Jane Goodall. Well, this was voted on by the Patreons. I put up um, four different uh, interesting kind of um, life stories, biographies, that I um, was interested in. And I was like, all right, what do you want to hear about? It was... It was a pretty close race, uh, but but Jane really pulled out in front. And then I was like, oh, no, is Matt going to be mad at me for covering something to do with chimps? You've done it before. You've done it before, Jess. <laughs> I had the same feeling about sea monkeys last week, <laughs> but it was too late. I'd written the whole thing and then I thought, hang on, monkeys. That oh, makes no. me think of someone. Jane Goodall. Well, 
Yeah, last oh. time it was because I did a bonus episode on a particular. I don't even remember what it was, but it was it like it was uh, the ha- uh, Harry Houdini. Yes, that's right. And you were like, "This is literally this could be an episode of Primates," and I'm like, "I'm so sorry." <laughs> In this case, it's about a person. I'm definitely releasing this on the Primates feed, by the way. <laughs> so hi to all the Primates listeners out there. I hope you're enjoying this episode I've put together of Primates. <laughs> just a guest report um, put together by me, De- Jessica. Yes, I'm just going to put you on warning. If next week your episode is a, a report on War and Peace, the book, I will <laughs> be pissed. That's oh, my thing. Fuck. <laughs> you will be war and peace. <laughs> I've actually been pissed been off. <laughs> working on that for a while, so uh, we are... <laughs> This is the beginning of the end for Do Go On. <laughs> I'm, I'm re- I have been, it's been on my list of topics to do for Primates for Ages. I'm stoked that you've uh, done the work for me today. Mm. Um, maybe I'll even get you just to send me over your report. Yeah, I'll was, read it out to some other guests. I was going to say, I was, at first I was going to say, feel free to have me back on. But yeah, okay, you could just take my work and read it to other people. No, I will literally just <laughs> upload this episode. <laughs> to the Primates feed. That will happen. <laughs> so hi to all the Primates listeners out there. Thanks for tuning in again. I'll, I'll put our theme song at the start. Perfect. Yeah, great. All right, well, we're killing two birds. <laughs> well, you put the you? theme song, but you can still hear the Do Go On theme song underneath it, so it just sounds horrific. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a mess. Everyone's like, what is happening? Um, yeah, so like uh, Jane Goodall, it's been suggested by uh, a few people. It's been suggested by Amelia Alma. Um, Shelley uh, McCorist, Jeff Wise, Clancy Greening and Blake Wilde have all suggested Jane Goodall in uh, Jack the Hat McVitie. Um, they all sound like names of gorillas who are pretending to be humans. <sighs> Talk about me. I think you might be onto something there. Is she a gorilla person or a chimp? Chimp. Chimp. I reckon they're chimps. They even sound even more like chimps. To clarify, she is a human being. Human, but she's a chimp. Enthusiast. Chimp enthusiast. Yeah. Chimp enthusiast. I'm an amateur primatologist. She's probably like semi professional. <laughs> I would say, yeah, 60 plus years. Ready to go pro any day now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I reckon she's she, she's sort of like, it's been a hobby up until this point. Yeah. She's in her mid to late 70s now and she's like, I'm ready to go pro. <laughs> you don't want to make your hobby yeah. your work. I mean, it uh, takes yeah, the joy you know, out of it. Yeah, exactly right. So uh, it's a name I know very well. And I think if, I could give you an elevator pitch about Jane Goodall, what she's famous for previously, but I didn't know a whole lot about sort of her early life and how she sort of became a, a very, very famous person. So I think this might be something that a few people, it might be a similar boat people are in. They're sort of like, I don't really know heaps of detail. And it's a really interesting story. So I thought I would uh, share it with you if you'll have me. Thank you so, Thank so, you so much. much. <laughs> uh, my background is uh, the time she was on The Simpsons. Are you going to cover that at all? Uh, Not sure if it was even her or they were just parodying her, but uh, she <laughs> was on there. You know what? That didn't come up in my research. <laughs> Turns out that uh, instead of uh, chimps, she's gone mad and has uh, been uh, using them to mine diamonds. <laughs> she's oh, hoarding yes. diamonds. I have a funny feeling she would not have played that <laughs> part. <laughs> she's pretty good at, like, taking the piss of herself and having a bit of a laugh, so maybe she would have, but I'm not... Not sure. It did not come up. Feel free to have a Google. Great. That's. Um, um, I just wanted to tick off the Simpsons reference for the episode, so we can all feel <laughs> that could be that can be a fun fact at the end if we want to. <laughs> we can fact check that. But Valerie Jane Morris Goodall was born in 1934 in Hampstead in London. Her parents were race car driver Whoa. Mortimer Morris Goodall. Morty. <laughs> was a race car driver originally like on wikipedia it said businessman and then in a few other um sources i was reading it was like yeah he was a famous race car driver i was like what business you and morty been a so driving real fast yeah he was he was quite famous as a race car driver and her mum was margaret mafanway joseph a novelist holy shit milford haven in pembrokeshire who wrote under the name of Van Morris Goodall. She was a, yeah, a novelist. From early childhood, Jane was fascinated by all animals and interest encouraged by her mother, Van. And when Mortimer Morris Goodall went to war, which broke out when Jane was about five, young Jane moved with her mother and younger sister, Judy, to live with her grandmother and aunts in the seaside town of Bournemouth, where they remained when her father and mother divorced following the war. I think English people will be annoyed by that pronounce. It's Bournemouth. <laughs> 
They we'll just get we'll get tweets if we don't correct yeah, it. Yeah, oh, thank you for born mouth. Born mouth. Born mouth. <laughs> Yeah, that sounds better. That sounds better. I'm really hoping you're going to reveal the info that uh, Bournemouth is uh, famous for chimps and that's when she first fell in love with the animal. No. Oh, come on. <laughs> Surely. Okay. Um, Bournemouth is f- Bournemouth famous for chimps. Thank you. Ah. That's cool. <laughs> well, was that a fun fact? Little seaside town famous yeah, little... for its chimp population. <laughs> no, they're, they're fish and chimps. They love it. <laughs> Come on, Dale, we'll get some fish and chips. No, there's one thing uh, England is famous for that is for executing chimps. <laughs> That's true. What? <laughs> it was a, I think it was a monkey, Dave, but yeah. Oh, fair enough, fair enough. Remember we went, we saw that statue, Jess, in Hartlepool. It's actually pronounced Hartlepool. Sorry, yes, I just remembered. <laughs> While we are annoying English people, we may as well. <laughs> <laughs> really dig the heels You in. genuinely not remember that part of our no. trip, Jess? When was this? We were searching around. We found two different statues. And one of the statues, in your defence, Dave, is clearly a chimp, even though it's meant to be a monkey. Thank you. Was I there? Oh, yeah. <laughs> we had we had lunch. We went into a pub to ask about it, and it was clear that they did not like being asked about it. I had a pie. I don't remember this at all. Oh, I remember Dave's pie. Thank you. I'm kidding. You ate a pie every fucking place we went. <laughs> but I was wearing a yellow jumper in the photo of this okay. one. Okay. <laughs> I remember the yellow pie, the yellow pie. Yeah, it was yellow pie. That's very nice. <laughs> anyway, so, um, yes, yeah, her parents divorced following the war. She was a precocious reader in a family of women who encouraged intellectual accomplishment. And Jane read everything she could get her hands on about wild animals and Africa. She did really well in school despite an unusual neurological condition, which I've never, oh, I can never pronounce it, um, prosopagnosia, it's face blindness. Oh. Um, Dr. Carl has it as well. Bit of fun. Yeah, so it's difficulty recognising faces. I have that for chimps. Like I can't tell chimps apart. Interesting. <laughs> Can you? I find it really hard to tell the difference between um, animals. Like you guys know, you'll see dogs and you'll be like, oh, there's my friend's dog. I'm like, it just looks like another dog. Well, I mean. Stand next to a poodle, I'm like, which is which? Okay, so you can't even tell different breeds of dogs apart. Yeah, I've got breed blindness. So if I was standing next to like a very short blonde woman, you wouldn't know who was who. No, no, I can tell the difference between human breeds. <laughs> it's not not dog breeds. Mine is I can't tell the difference between pickles and cucumbers. So there you go. Okay. Well, isn't it a cucumber is a pickle once it's been pickled? There you go. <laughs> These are not the no, same. It's a, oh, sorry. It's a <laughs> as face blindness. It's a cucumber no. and a zucchini. I always find that very confusing. Very confusing. Yeah, right. Right. Well, I mean, like, do you mean even up until the point where you've cut it open, you can't tell? Oh, that's the point of no return, and then I realise it's all over. You're just cutting stuff open in the supermarket. Yeah. Hang on. This one's a zucchini. <laughs> just snapping Taking it. Taking a bite. <laughs> well, I still don't know. Sorry, Jess. I didn't mean to be insensitive about uh, the face. No, no, blindness. no. I'm just saying, like. Neither of these are good examples of things you can't tell. <laughs> I'll, I'll just, I'll just trying to, I was just trying to put it in terms that you know maybe as other listeners might understand. But sometimes you can't, you can't tell things apart. Mm, yeah, mm. like, like breeds of dog. So it's impressive to you that Dave and I can go to the park with our pet dogs and return home with the same dog, yeah, the same yeah. one. Yeah, there have been times when other Frenchies have been there, and I've gone, fuck. Yeah, Uh-oh. especially from a distance, you're like, I don't know who's who. Okay. You're yelling oh, at another good. person's dog from a distance. Goat! Um, I've also been at the park um, with the dogs, with Michelle Brazier and her dog, who is a black lab, and there's just been like three other black labs around, and we're like, oh, no. <laughs> and two of them had had the same colour collar on, and we're like, oh, dear, who is who? <laughs> <laughs> oh, so dog people don't necessarily, so you can't tell a dog's face from another it dog's depa- face It depends. Probably. If they're similar-ish looking. Yeah. Like in Planet of the Return of the Planet of the Apes or whatever, or no, the, the rebooted ones, they made them look pretty different. You know, Cobra was a bonobo, I think, for instance. <laughs> and then and Caesar was just like the most magnificent looking <laughs> <laughs> specimen. So you can pick he him out. He was a hottie. 
Yeah, yeah, he was a super you, bad. You knew it was him when you got a stiffy. Boy, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Some people call them uh, erections. I call them Caesar, <laughs> Caesar alarms. <laughs> oh, the Caesar alarm's going off. <laughs> Sounds to me like you're just justifying that primate's upload. <laughs> yeah. It also, um, I'm just realising as well, I mean, that what I was just reading before, was a, a quote from uh, one of the articles I was reading and it was sort of saying that she did well at school despite that condition. But doing, like, being able to read and, and comprehend things at school has very little to do with being able to recognise faces. Mm, there's rarely, so, like, a multiple yeah. choice with which who which of these is our queen and there's four different photos. Yeah, it feels the right like one. they just really wanted to put in a, a fun fact about her. Yeah, it would be maybe harder for social interactions at school, but not, yeah. not necessarily, you wouldn't think, academically. Academically, yeah, it would be, I would think, fine. Once again, Dr. Carl has it. Yeah. And he's a doctor. <laughs> so You're talking about Carl Kennedy? <laughs> Dr. Carl Kennedy. Or Krizel Nitsky. That one. Okay. So young Jane spent as much time outside as she could in nature. She spent many hours at the top of her favourite tree, reading. She would just climb... That's sick. Love that. She was particularly fond of the story of Tarzan, which inspired her childhood dream to go to Africa and live with animals. Jane described her mother in a very fond and appreciative way, saying she was always fair, she was never angry without a reason, she always supported my love of animals, she never said, well, you're just a girl, you can't do that. Why don't you dream about something you can actually achieve, which is what everybody else told me. While their family seemed to be quite wealthy, like based on photos and like the house they lived in, I was like, they are a comfortable family. Um, apparently not not so. And they couldn't afford a university education for Jane. It might have also been that like it wasn't as easy back then for women. Not like these days. <laughs> it's I'm actually, so I'm easy. getting sick of it. Like I've done so much good feminist work that I'm starting to think, do I need to start correcting this i've, I've overcorrected <laughs> oh now God. and women have got it too good mm-hmm, you know what i mean mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you probably can tell that yes you starting to feel how guilty good I have it? how good you've got it yeah 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 yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. so I might, I might have to start undoing some of that work i've, I've done over the okay. years okay how do you want to do you want to just talk over me as, as yeah. much as possible okay that's a good start i think yeah if you could just explain things to me a bit, that would be good. Well, I'm glad you brought up Jane Goodall. Uh, I'll take it from here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, they can't afford an education for Jane, so instead she moves to London. She gets work as a secretary. In the late 1950s, an opportunity arose to visit a family friend in Kenya and Jane, having always been drawn to Africa, jumped at the chance. She's like, get me there. So she returned to Bournemouth where her family were, sorry, Bournemouth, uh, <laughs> and, and worked as a waitress in a local hotel, earning, uh, saving every penny she could just to fund this trip to Kenya. She made it to Kenya in 1957, and while she was there, she made contact with archaeologist and paleontologist, now brace yourself for an incredible name here, Lewis Leakey. <laughs> So good. Leaky. <laughs> Do not get on a boat with Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> Lewis Leaky. Very good. He wears adult diapers for sure. <laughs> yeah. He's got a leak. Archaeologist and paleontologist. Um, she made contact with him just, just to, like, pick his brain and chat to him about animals. She's just very interested and, and fascinated and, and, and enthusiastic. But it just so happened that Lewis Leakey was looking for someone to research chimpanzees for him because he thought studying apes could provide insight and answers into humans' Stone Age ancestors. He was like, I think there's like clues into early man within if we just observe apes. Jane had no training or scientific degree, but Lewis didn't care. He wanted someone with an open mind, a passion for knowledge, a love of animals, and monumental patience. He didn't mention his ideas straight away to Jane. Instead, he hired her as a secretary. And over the next couple of years, Leakey laid the foundation for the work Jane Goodall would go on to do for the rest of her life. In 1958, he sent her to London to study primate behaviour with British primatologist Osmond Hill. 
and by 1960, Leakey had raised funds to send Jane to Gombe Stream National Park, located in western Kingoma region of Tanzania. Now, the question is, has he explained to her yet that she's going to study chimps, or does she still think he's working as a secretary? And she's like, why does he keep getting me to study all this chimp stuff? <laughs> it's so wow. weird. It- no, I think by this point he's... He's uh, shared this. Send me to Tanzania. I just don't know what I'm doing here. I don't like. Do I take my typewriter? <laughs> what does he want? I'm packing the filing cabinet. <laughs> this boss is weird. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, he, uh, prior to this Gombe expedition, virtually nothing was known about chimpanzees in the wild. So Jane's mission was to get close to the chimpanzees, to live among them, to be accepted by them. That was the that was her whole mission. She said, I wanted to get as close to talking to animals as I could, to be like Dr. Doolittle. I wanted to move among them without fear, like Tarzan. Her only real plan when she first arrived in Gombe was to try to get the chimpanzees used to her so that she could observe them and learn about them, because she said the only way to really learn about animals is for them to know you're there but to ignore you. (laughs) Does that make sense? Yeah, otherwise they're modifying their behaviour. So you need them to... Yeah, I, even better, not know you're there. <laughs> I guess so, yeah, right? But then you can't get close enough to them. As soon as you get close enough, they're going to be aware of you and then they're going to be they're either going to run, which she experiences a lot, or, yeah, be very cautious of you. So I guess it does make sense. They need to be comfortable with you. It really feels like she's lucky she wasn't torn apart. Yeah. If they, yeah, if they knew nothing about them going in. And it's very interesting you say that because she had zero fear because no one had studied the animals enough to know that they were dangerous. Right. (laughs) But also because she felt like this was where she was supposed to be. She felt like this was what she was born to do. This was sort of her destiny and she just genuinely kind of felt like nothing's going to hurt me. I feel like there's probably a lot of these similar stories in history where people don't know anything about tigers or sharks and this one person finds out the hard way. So it could have easily gone terribly for her. Yeah, and we kind of now know that they are dangerous and that they can be violent because of her studies. Right. Oh, wow. But going into it, she's like, yeah, it'll be fine. And it's so crazy. So a lot of this, um, not a lot of it, but like one of the, there's, she's the subject of about 40 documentaries. I watched one um, that was made in 2017. Basically, I'm going to talk about um, stuff that comes up, but there's all this footage from when she was first there that they thought they lost and they found it a few years ago, like 2014, they found all this footage again. So you've got all this footage from when she first arrives and she's like 26, she's in like Converse just through the Tanzania jungle just like with her binoculars and a little bag where she's just got a can of beans with her and it's <laughs> it's the most amazing footage. It's on Disney Plus. Like if anybody's interested, definitely go check it out. It's just called Jane. It's incredible. But she's just like, yeah, nothing's going to hurt me. This is just where I'm destined to be. It's wild. And in those days, it wasn't considered safe for a young single woman to go on this expedition alone. So she's 26. They're like, you need a companion. You need a chaperone. It's not safe. So she's like, no worries. I'll take my mum. (laughs) So her mum goes with her. Her mum's a novelist, but her mum, like, spends some time while she's there, like, administering medicine to local people and, like, she's just there to support her daughter. She's like, you do you. You do your research and I'll just hang out. It's Really nice. So she spends each day, like I was saying, little bag, <laughs> some snacks, <laughs> binoculars, a can of beans, can of beans, and she sort of tries to get as close as she can to the chimps. Um, generally, all she experiences is them running away from her. So all that she's sort of observing is their behaviour as they are fleeing, <laughs> or behaviour of theirs from a distance where she's just watching them through binoculars. So she's not having the most luck and she's feeling a bit frustrated. Day 51, run away again. (laughs) God, they're beautiful (laughs) when they run though. (laughs) Just gorgeous. Five months into her stay in Gombe, after searching three different valleys looking for the chimps, she'd found none. She's like, oh, God. She was like, it was a shithouse morning. She's having a terrible day. She's like, can't find any of the chimps. I've looked everywhere. Then... Not too far away from her, she spotted one. It was an adult male who she recognised because of his white hair on his chin. Unlike the others, he didn't run from her. 
And this was her breakthrough. It was her first sign of acceptance. And from there, she was able to get closer and closer to the chimps and observe them in more detail. She learned that they spend long hours in grooming sessions and they need friendly contact and reassurance, which is very cute. Some of the footage is them just sort of like patting each other on the back or holding hands. Oh, so not from her. She's not yelling out, you look great. Oh, my God, you look amazing. Nobody saw you fall. It's okay. No one saw that. I won't tell him. (laughs) You can totally pull off yellow, babe. Yeah, all that sort of reassurance that we all need. Oh, yeah. I didn't know I could pull off yellow until someone yelled it at me. That was me, wasn't it? I remember that. Yeah. We didn't even know each other at the time. That's how we met. You look amazing, babe. (laughs) I said, oh, please don't yell at me, sir. But okay. (laughs) I will make this purchase. You're 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 in the change rooms trying on a yellow top. (laughs) I've jumped over the top. Honestly, it was inappropriate looking back. I didn't know. Different time. Different time. Different time. (laughs) It was fine with the chimps. <laughs> yeah. Thought it'd be fine. Yeah. Back at Chadston. <laughs> yeah. Turns out that it's one of the differences between chimps and humans. There are only a few differences and that's one yeah, of them. Yeah, well, something like 98, 99, 98% same yeah. DNA wise. That's the difference. That's the difference is we get a bit weird when we're naked in front of each other. <laughs> don't, don't look at me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> So as she got to know them more and and noticed their personalities more, instead of numbering the chimpanzees, which would have been sort of common practice at the time, is numbering them, she gave them names. Now, she's been criticised for that in some ways because I think the reason for numbering is sort of so that you don't get emotionally attached to them, but she named them. Um, the first one, the one that hadn't feared her with the little white chin hairs, his name was David Greybeard. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fun name. It's very fun. He was often accompanied by the top-ranking male at the time who she named Goliath. Then there was Mr McGregor, who was a grumpy old man. <laughs> like Peter Rabbit. That's yeah. cute. And then there was Flo, who was a, a female with a bulbous nose and ragged ears. She, she refers to Flo all the time with a bulbous nose and ragged ears. And Flo had an infant daughter named Fifi. So this is just some of them. Obviously, there's heaps, but it's just a few. That, is there any she um, doesn't like, like dickhead or <laughs> big dumb shit? <laughs> Fuck face. <laughs> Asshole. Um, <laughs> keeps naming him after his yeah. boyfriend. <laughs> oh, he's a real Gareth. Ugh. <laughs> and said, at that time in the early 1960s, it was held at least by many scientists that only humans had minds. Only humans were capable of rational thought. Fortunately, I'd not been to university and I did not know these things. So I think, like, there was a real benefit for her not having had the formal education that others may have had because she wasn't, she didn't have sort of preconceived ideas. She was just observing. She was just watching and learning and, yeah, observing some pretty, some pretty amazing stuff. She said, I felt very much like I was learning about fellow beings capable of joy and sorrow, fear and jealousy. She also observed behaviours such as hugs, kisses, pats on the back and even tickling, <laughs> what we consider human actions. <laughs> they tickle each At other. At university, everyone knew that only humans tickle each other. <laughs> only humans tickle. And Elmo. <laughs> only humans and Elmo tickle. Thanks very much. Are you guys ticklish? Oh, yeah. Everywhere yeah. or specifics? Uh, um. Under my armpits, I'm dangerously ticklish is how I describe it. Okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, bottom of my, soles of my feet. I will kick to free myself. Matt's being very cagey and quiet, which I think means he's yeah, very don't ticklish. want to expose a weakness. I'm just, I'm not really sure. I think you guys are foolish uh, if you're ever held hostage. Now mm. they know to tickle your feet, Jess, and your pits, Dave. Oh, God. You've given too much away. There'll be chimps listening to this as well. <laughs> So you may be held chimp hostage. I love to, love to tickle. Such long fingers. <laughs> yes. I could tickle both my feet at once. Oh, God. <laughs> Unlike a human. <laughs> I couldn't. How? How could they, How could they do both? <laughs> you got to use one hand to hold my foot down. Yeah. Anyway, she said it had long been thought that we were the only creatures on earth that made and used tools. Man, the tool maker is how we were defined. <laughs> Man, the tool maker. Man, the tool man, Taylor. (laughs) Exactly. 
<laughs> but Jane observed the chimps strip leaves off twigs and make tools for themselves to extract termites from termite mounds. They would sort of like stick them in. It's like fishing termites out. The object <laughs> modification. I was laughing about, you know how there's like the Bronze Age, the Stone Age. They're still in the Stick Age. <laughs> <laughs> but, hey, yeah, good, good on them, you know. The object modification of stripping the leaves off is the crude beginning of tool making. And this, along with her observation of the chimp systematically hunting and eating smaller primates, were major discoveries which challenged two long-standing beliefs of the day, that only humans could construct and use tools and that chimpanzees were vegetarians. For some reason, people are like, nah, they, they eat leaves. <laughs> we've never looked, but we assume. <laughs> we've never looked, never, we've never seen them eat, but they don't eat meat. And we're the only ones who make tools. <laughs> Demand the tool man Taylor. So, oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so but they do eat smaller primates. That's brutal to imagine, isn't it? Yeah, she sort of she watched them. There was like this small. I, don't, I didn't note down what, what they were. It was like a smaller little primate there, and she noticed that maybe the, a loris. She, no, it wasn't a loris. What's well, something in the cutie pie family, perhaps? <laughs> Jess? Yeah, I reckon it was probably pretty cute, which is very oh, disappointing God. for me because how dare you eat a cutie pie, a cutie pie primate? Yeah, she watched as they sort of, it was quite systematic and like a real collaborative team effort to surround and hunt and kill and eat this, this primate. When she telegrammed the discovery to Lewis Leakey, he responded with, we must now redefine man or accept chimpanzees as human. <laughs> Whoa. What a great response. <laughs> it's pretty full on. <laughs> All right, so what we've got to do is, number one, redefine man. Number two, accept chimps as humans. This is my brother, Chimp Hank. Uh, number three, if you could put in a good word with for me with the hottest one, that would be great. <laughs> I am looking for You're a chimp You're talking about wife. Caesar. <laughs> do you think we could make chimp-human hybrids? <laughs> two options, accept them as human. Yeah, must now redefine man or accept chimpanzees as human. Which one do they do? <laughs> <laughs> and Jane said, my observations at Gombe would challenge human uniqueness and whenever that happens there is always a violent uproar. People tried to discredit her observations and discoveries because she was an untrained girl, mostly the girl part. Um, one headline literally said, chimpanzee study told by woman. Okay. Which is pretty, pretty funny. Um, another said, Comely Miss spends her time eyeing apes. <laughs> Bit of fun. However, despite some critics, the discovery meant that Lewis Leakey was able to obtain a grant from the National Geographic Society to continue Jane's studies. And in addition, they would be sending out a photographer to document the chimps and to document, like, more of her research as well. So Jane wasn't really thrilled about that. She was used to being out there on her own and enjoyed the solitude. And I think in a way it sort of felt like an intrusion on her project. It it, it felt quite personal to her and bringing somebody else in is sort of like bringing somebody into your space can be kind of challenging. But she understood that it, was, it wasn't really up to her and the National Geographic Society were funding this expedition. And so she needed to just cooperate so that she could continue to do her work. So July 1962, Hugo van Lorik, a Dutch filmmaker and photographer, arrived in Gombe to join Jane. Hugo was a chain-smoking perfectionist, both of which drove Jane nuts. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's, what, that, that's the kind of reinforcements you want, people who make you yeah. bonkers. Drive you bloody bonkers. But it's a classic sort of, um, it feels like, it feels like a rom-com kind of setup in that it's like, oh, bloody hell, he's so annoying. And he's like, she's such a stickler. And then they're sitting around like the first night and it turns out they have quite a lot in common and his childhood dream was to photograph animals and um, travel around Africa. And she's like, oh, <laughs> that was also my childhood dream. Weird you ended up here. <laughs> yeah, weird you ended up here in Africa with that camera you've got there. Oh, perfectionist. Oh, so you're getting quite good quality stuff, are <laughs> yeah. you? Oh, okay. Oh, so in the future you might be considered one of the best wildlife photographers there's ever been. Oh, okay. Sure, whatever. Uh-oh, my Caesar alarm's going off. <laughs> 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 Apparently they eat monkeys, Jess. About 6% of a chimpanzee's diet is meat and animal products. It's, it's monkey. And monkeys are, are the common ones. Yeah, but right. But it sounds like they eat everything. There's a recent article saying... 
for the first time they've been observed cracking open a tortoise shell and eating the insides. Oh, wow. Hmm. There you go. But, but, but like 6%, fussy. did you yeah, say? Yeah, so it's pretty low. So they're not pretty far. Low. Yeah, right. They sound like, uh, you know, they maybe they do uh, meat-free Monday through Friday. <laughs> yeah, they're kind of like meat with meat, to yeah. be honest. <laughs> it's like, no, nah, every now and then maybe it's A little food. salami, little tortoise. Yeah, a little bit of chicken. But you said that there's new info about them cracking open a tortoise. I guess that means we've got two options. We either. <laughs> <laughs> we redefine tortoise. <laughs> or accept them as human. I mean, it's the only option. <laughs> Every time I find out any info. Well, well I guess well, we. We're at a crossroads here. I've seen, I've seen a human crack open a tortoise, so I guess. Anyway, so they're working um, over the next few months. Um, Hugo sort of following Jane out on her expeditions. He's filming all the. All, all the chimps. Uh, he's filming Jane a fair bit as well, sort of like, you know, documenting everything that's happening. One day they return to their camp to be told that while she was gone, a chimp had snuck into her tent and taken bananas. <laughs> okay. Just snuck in. So they're like, the next day they wait, hoping to observe the chimp doing the same thing. They're like, they're getting more comfortable, like the audacity of this of this chimp getting so close to their camp, it's like, are they getting more comfortable with us? Like they're, they're sort of testing boundaries, they're pushing boundaries a little bit. That's that's good. Like let's see if it will happen again. And sure enough, it like took all day, but sure enough, a chimp arrives and would you bloody believe it, it's David Greybeard. No. <laughs> Whoa. Yeah. The singer David Greybeard. <laughs> David Greybeard. After that she always had plenty of bananas with her. It was sort of a way of like winning their affection. Gradually, the chimps would allow Jane to get closer to them. And in some footage in the doco, Jane, one of them eventually just walks straight up to her and takes bananas out of her hand. <laughs> There's footage like she's sort of holding some bananas and she's kind of looking away. She's trying not to, she's being really still and there's more bananas sort of scattered around and one of them sort of coming close and is picking up some that are nearby her, but it's still a bit wary of her. And then another one just like walks straight up, takes the bananas out of her hands, like sort of touches her and then just pisses <laughs> off. And it's amazing to watch. As the chimps became more comfortable, eventually they weren't even scared of the humans and this led to its own set of problems. They became more audacious in their thievery. <laughs> they stole blankets, kitchen cloths, shirts, pillows, cardboard boxes, anything they fancied. They just started coming in, helping themselves to their camp. Now rather than one or two chimps arriving to take bananas, big groups would arrive at camp and aggression broke out between the chimps. Every A couple of times it got so bad that the humans would sort of have to take cover, like they would sort of oh, barricade themselves in their tents There's a chimp stuff. shootout. <laughs> so to manage the aggression they came up with this feeding station system where they would put bananas in steel boxes which had like a release hatch which Jane could release from a distance, and then the 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 chimps would sort of open it up, take their bananas, and off they'd go. I like this. It made it a lot more orderly. Definitely, um, they've set it up so that they're not interfering at all with their natural mm. behaviour. Mm. Now mm. setting up a machine for, to feed them bananas. <laughs> yeah, but now yeah, we're yeah. observing them in their natural habitat with the metal Just boxes. Them to it. <laughs> set up a chimp canteen. <laughs> There's a food court going on. We assume this would have happened naturally even if we weren't here. Hey, even if I wasn't getting tons of bananas shipped in, they'd somehow be finding all of these bananas. Like, it's not me. Yeah. So eventually after after a little while it came time for Hugo to leave Gombe and Jane realised they'd grown quite close and she would miss him. And after he left, Jane received a telegram. Oh, I fucking love telegrams because it said... Will you marry me? Stop. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Will you marry me? Stop. Hang on, what? And said, love, stop, Hugo. You've stopped loving me. Love, stop. <laughs> love, stop. Baby, love, stop. Will you marry me? Stop. She replied. But how long before you get a reply? You send that off. You're sitting there for three weeks not knowing what they're going to say. Oh, my God. Imagine proposing and the person you're proposing to hesitates even slightly. <laughs> You'd be like, oh, I want to die <laughs> this way. You are just waiting oh. around for months. Am I right in saying that she he, he's proposing to her and they've never 
updated or anything. Who knows? Like, who knows what's oh, happening? Okay. <laughs> what happens in Gombe uh, stays right. in Gombe, you know? Meet you behind the, <laughs> behind the canteen. And it was the old days. They were a bit more, like, they, they were kind of more coy with these things, weren't they? It was a bit more like... Hey, I love you. Oh, hey, do you? Okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? They were very good. It was a lot more pride and prejudice oh, back yeah. Organise the wedding. Yes. Hey, hey, John. Get the Reverend on the line. Hello, Reverend. <laughs> anyway, so she replied, yes. Stop. Stop. <laughs> love, Jane. Stop. <laughs> if she just wrote back, stop. Isn't that nice? Stop. That would be very confusing. <laughs> stop. Stop. <laughs> Asking, stop. <laughs> Me, stop. Hammer time, stop. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a pretty good meet cute, you know. How'd your parents meet? That's nice. So March 28th, 1964, they were married in London. They remained in London for a little while so that Jane could obtain her doctorate in ethology, study of animal behaviour at Cambridge University. She became the eighth person to be allowed to study for a PhD there without having to obtain a, a Bachelor of, a bachelor of oh, Science great. first. So she's gone straight to doctorate. Her thesis was completed in, in 1966. Oh, no. Oh, 1966. <laughs> I wouldn't know. That would have, that's the year that the Beatles released Revolver, known <laughs> as one of the all-time greatest <laughs> rock albums. Well, also the year that uh, the Chicago Bulls were founded, and the year that the Saints won their one and only premiership in the VFL slash AFL competition. Maybe from now on, you can also add that it was the year that um, Jane Goodall completed her thesis, which was on the behaviour of free living chimpanzees. Maybe I can. Maybe I could. Which detailed her first five years of study of the Gombe Reserve. Just you know, just fun, just fun little fact. Is Gombe referenced in the song? Land Down Under or Down Under. Something in a combi head full of zombie. Is there a rhyme in there that they were going through gombi? <laughs> Is that, I don't that know. might be too many ombi rhymes. Doesn't matter. <laughs> Another important interjection here from me. <laughs> I don't know. I will probably never know. Well, I can think of Man in Bombay. Yes. The slack jaw and not much to say. Did you see the, uh, the clip of the boomers, as in the Australian basketball team, the boomers partying to Down Under? Pretty fun. After yeah. their bronze medal. <laughs> Bit of fun. Anyway, just please go on. So after they were married and returned to Gombe, they learned that one of the females they'd come to know, Flo, had given birth to a son who Jane named Flint. Flo had a few kids. All of them had F names. Bit of fun. Um, this was a big deal because it gave them an opportunity to start a study that could last decades because it was the first time an infant chimp um, could be studied and the relationship between parent and child could be observed so closely in the wild. So they were sort of like, I mean, it's we've got an infant here. We could This is a study that could last his whole lifetime. And not only the relationship, that relationship, so like um, parent and child, but Jane was also able to observe the relationship between baby Flint and his older sister, Fifi, who was very nurturing and played with her brother a lot and, like a lot of older siblings, became a very useful helper to her mother. So it was really cute. Like um, apparently really early on when he was very small, like Fifi would try to pick him up and stuff and and the mum would sort of stop her and eventually as he got a little bit bigger she'd let she'd let the older sister like pick him up, carry him around and, and Fifi would really care for him and nurture him as well. It was very sweet but really interesting how that sort of dynamic happens. Baby chimps, so cute. Oh, my <laughs> God, so cute. I'm looking at their little their big eyes and they're just so cute. I'm like, I would die for you. <laughs> Are you kidding me? A little baby chimp? Oh, my God. So cute. Oh. <laughs> What? You wouldn't die for a baby chimp? No. I'd die at the hand of an adult chimp, though. <laughs> <laughs> Almost definitely. If you if you got me near them, they would not take to me, I don't think. But they're so cute. Anyway, so these observations about the, like, that family dynamic, their discoveries fueled more interest in Jane and Hugo's work, which they needed to pounce on. They needed to sort of like capitalise on this interest because they needed to raise more funding for themselves. 
So they successfully applied for additional funding to build a research station in Gombe and took in students to assist them in collecting data. With things in Gombe under control, Jane and Hugo returned to the UK and travelled around Europe and America, Jane speaking at events and being interviewed on radio and TV about her studies. Her studies were so groundbreaking and the fact that a young woman was doing it was so hugely interesting to people at the time. And so she became somewhat of a celebrity, like she was big news. Um, While they were there, a meeting with the National Geographic Society determined that despite Jane and Hugo's insistence that it was beneficial, Hugo's photography services would no longer be required on the project. She was sort of like, we've captured all this amazing stuff. And they're like, "Mm, we disagree, which is baffling, especially in today's age when we sort of like everything's filmed and everything's documented. But for them to sort of go, I just don't really see how filming the chimps and actually having evidence of stuff that they do is any benefit to anyone. Yeah, so, just a fad. This is just a fad. <laughs> yeah. Seems really strange. And there was a few times where, like, every sort of discovery she made, people would try to discredit her, but a big help she had was that she had that evidence that Hugo had filmed it. So it's it seems a bit baffling. But anyway, now they sort of have to figure out what to do because they're newly married, but... They kind of knew it might happen because that's sort of the nature of the job as a as a cameraman is that the project's jobs end. So they had to find other work to do. Hugo got a job filming wildlife in the Serengeti and Jane went with him and spent her time writing books and checking in with the students at Gombe on the, on the radio. She's like every day she's chatting to them, checking in on what's happening, and there's footage in the docker of her just sitting in the back of like a truck one of those like big Jeep things. She's just got a typewriter and she's just sitting there typing, writing a book while he's making movies. Oh, back to secretary work. Yeah. She's like, what was that? Uh-huh. Yes, type, type. Stop. He's taking the minutes. <laughs> <laughs> while she missed being at Gombe, it gave her an opportunity to observe more animals, to grow her knowledge and understanding and to widen her experience. So she was she was very appreciative for it. She, she wasn't resentful at all. They spent the next few years going back and forth between Gombe and the Serengeti, and in 1967, an unexpected visitor joined them on their expeditions. Jane gave birth to their son, Hugo Eric Lewis Van Lorik, or Grub, as they affectionately <laughs> called him. <laughs> Grub. What a difference between those two names, a, a quadruple banger, sort of real posh-sounding yeah. name, or Grub. <laughs> Grub. We'll call him Grub. <laughs> So Anthony Russell's thistle sweat or poop. <laughs> <laughs> Did you say that it was an unexpected arrival? Did they not yes. realise she was in fact pregnant. No, they I they had not really discussed or planned their future all Sex that much. Sex ed wasn't they had... what it is today. Back then, they <laughs> yeah, didn't know. They hadn't really planned children all that she much. She knew how it works with chimps but not humans. <laughs> not they humans. They used the rhythm method. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking, I was talking about this at the time actually because, I mean, they were very happy with having a child. It wasn't, it wasn't an issue for them at any stage in their entire life. But I was sort of like, if you're working out in the African wildlife and maybe kids aren't super convenient right now, could you not use protection? And then I was like, could you back then? And then we couldn't figure out, like, how long have condoms been around for? A long time, I think. Yeah, okay. They used to be reusable. I think back in the day oh. you'd just get one and you have to wash it after use. Oh. <laughs> or, or, I don't know if that's an urban myth. I, someone told me that at one or point. Or use, like, a, sheep, a sheep's intestine. Yeah, that's right. Which is Everything was intestines back then. <laughs> I should say I was around at the time. I, I remember my first uh, dinger very fun. Washing out your dinger. <laughs> you are, of course, uh, a 600-year-old virgin, so it's fine. That's true, yeah. you to rinse out the dinger. I always dreamed of getting a chance to rinse it out. <laughs> it's sat in its packet. <laughs> yeah. Pristine dinger. This could be used multiple times. Could be. <laughs> <laughs> Do you reckon there's an episode in that, the history of condoms? Well, I'm just thinking why do I find that gross but, like, there's reusable sanitary products and I don't find those Yeah, it's actually they're quite, it's quite environmentally friendly. Yeah, it probably makes more sense. Anyway, that's that's where my mind went. If you saw me staring out my window for a bit, I was like, Am You're I on a one-night stand. Part of the problem? You get home and the guy's like, sorry, just got to go uh, clean something, nothing important. I'll be back, back in a jiff. 
That's pretty romantic. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Anyway, so yes, they've they've had a son, Grub. Um, he's just he's like Hugo Junior, but I'm going to call him Grub. This <laughs> it's entire very book. funny that she named a chimp David, but her son is Grub. <laughs> That's a good point. That's, That's a very so good, good point. <laughs> the first rubber condoms were made in 1855. Oh, shit. And they were okay. started to be yeah. mass produced in the 1860s. But skin condoms are more popular. Wow. I don't want to. Because don't want they were cheaper and the early rubber ones tended to fall off. <laughs> oh. But then there's also factors of like religion and, you know, other sort of beliefs that, that factor in as to whether or not you believe in contraception, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, so they have Grub and he <laughs> was raised in the African wildlife. He just accompanied his parents wherever their work took them. Chimps, though, as we discussed earlier, are known for hunting smaller primates. Uh-oh. So they built an extensive protective cage for Grub and never left his side as Jane continued her studies at Gombe. Essentially, they put him in a cage. He was a caged boy. They put a kid in the cage. It's like a, it's it's massive. Like it's this big enclosure he's got. <laughs> the boy. <laughs> massive in a tiny cage. It looks very uncomfortable. No, it's this huge big sort of, it's just like a an enclosed, it looks like it could be, it's massive. Like and he's got toys, he's got everything he needs. Just like a he's play very pen. Comfortable. Cage is a bit yeah, dramatic. Yeah, exactly right. Play exactly cage. Exactly right. <laughs> but it does feel like they've missed a golden opportunity to see what a human baby would interact with where their baby chimp would look like. Oh, my God. Imagine how cute that would look. I would die for that. <laughs> Human babies are nowhere near as cute as chimp babies, Jess. Come on, be honest. God, no. But if you had one of each, I'd be like, oh, look at them bridging the gap. <laughs> Unlikely friends. It's so cute. Unlikely friendship. I so would cute. die for grub. <laughs> I would die for grub. <laughs> Uh, uh. And J- this is Jane clarifying the um, the baby enclosure. <laughs> she says that was when he was a very tiny baby before he could walk. It was a sort of cage which we built, but you could stand upright and walk across in it and he couldn't even crawl. It was like a giant cot. He was never on his own. He was never left for even five minutes without somebody in the room with him and I never left him for one single night until he was three years old. So he just sort of went with them. I saw this... Um, in the documentary, there was like a, a journalist went and and met with them, and he was talking about how you know this little toddler speaks English to his parents and Swahili to this um, African man who is his only human friend, and and that he has that he does all these animal noises and stuff as well. So it's like there's such an interesting and and unique childhood, but when he turned six. Um, he was sent to England for his schooling and lived with Jane's mother there. And Jane would return to the UK for Christmas and in the spring and Grub would spend summers in Tanzania Grub. with his mother. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> not, I'm not going to get used to it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to giggle every time. So, yeah, first six years of his life, he's like growing up in Africa and then sent to England for school and, and essentially sort of half raised by his grandmother. And Grub wasn't the only one that Jane was separated from for long periods of time. Hugo and Jane were spending most of their time in different places and drifted apart, eventually divorcing in 1974. Another thing that happened in 1974, and one thing that a couple of people specifically suggested for this topic, was that Jane and her research team at Gombe started to notice the chimpanzee community splintering. Over a span of eight months, a large party of chimpanzees separated themselves into the southern area of Kasakela and were named the Kahama community. The separatists consisted of six adult males, three adult females, and their young. The Kasakela were left with eight adult males, 12 adult females, and their young. What followed was years of aggression and violence between these groups of chimps. It was a full on chimp. Wow, that's war. amazing. Yeah. First blood was drawn by the Kasakela community on uh, January 7th, 1974, when a party of six adult males ambushed an isolated male named Godi while he was feeding on a tree. This was the first time that any of the chimpanzees had been seen to deliberately kill a fellow male Whoa, chimp. Wow, they killed him. Yeah. After they'd slain Godi, the victorious chimps celebrated boisterously throwing and dragging branches with hoots and screams. 
It was like they were like, what is happening here? This is baffling to see. It was just this full on, it was very much on purpose. Like it wasn't an accident. It wasn't like in self-defense. They like hunted him down. Wow. Now, I didn't want to go into too much terrible detail. Um, somebody suggested it could be a, its own sort of mini episode, but it's like it's pretty bleak. But during the four-year conflict, all males of the Kahama community were killed, so the ones who had sort of separated, oh. effectively disbanding the community. Of the females, one was killed, two went missing, which could probably just mean either killed but more likely went and joined other chimp communities in, in different areas and three were beaten, kidnapped and sort of brought back into the original. Kidnapped and brought back in. Wow. Yeah. That was... Yeah, that's really fascinating. Yeah, do you think that says anything about um, human nature? Does that reflect in us at all? But, but yeah, possibly. I don't know. Do we have to have one of two options here? Are you suggesting it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess there's only two <laughs> options we have. <laughs> Redefine man or <laughs> get a new bike. <laughs> so the victorious Casakella uh, group then expanded into further territory but were later repelled by another community of chimpanzees. And eventually hostilities died down and the regular order of things was restored. But this was like over a four-year period. It was just like constant fighting. When Goodall reported on the events of the Gombe War, her account of a naturally occurring war between chimpanzees was not universally believed. Oh, for like, God's sake. Like everything. <laughs> At the time, scientific models of human and animal behaviour virtually never overlapped. They're like, no, 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 honey, no, humans go to war, okay? That's not animals. Some scientists accused her of excessive anthrop anthropomorphism. Nailed it! Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, um, you know, putting human behaviour onto animals. Others suggested that her presence and her practice of feeding the chimpanzees had created violent conflict in a naturally peaceful society. However, later research using less intrusive methods confirmed that chimpanzee societies in their nat natural state wage war just happens. Oh, my God. Yeah. Wild. World War Chimp. So interesting. There was like a polio outbreak earlier on in amongst the, some of the chimps and, yeah, some of the chimps were really unwell and it was just like it, she was studying these chimps over such a long period of time that she's just seen so much happen to them, happen around them. It's really amazing. And like I said, she's, the, and I'll say it again at the end, that she's like subject of so many films and documentaries and stuff. There's a lot of information out there. So I'm kind of just like, you know, giving you the, the headlines. A few little things before we finish up, though. In 1977, she established the Jane Goodall Institute, which supports the Gombe research. And she is a global leader in the effort to protect chimpanzees and their habitats. With 19 offices around the world, the Jane Goodall Institute is widely recognised for community-centred conservation and development programs in Africa. Uh, its global youth program called Roots and Shoots, that's good, <laughs> began in 1991 when a group of 16 local teenagers met with Goodall on her back porch in Tanzania um, because they were eager to discuss a range of problems they knew about from first-hand experience that caused them deep concern. And the organisation now has over 10,000 groups in 100 countries. It's just really expanded. In 92, Goodall founded um, a chimpanzee rehabilitation centre in the Republic of Congo um, to care for chimpanzees orphaned due to bushmeat trade. Their rehab houses over 100 chimps. Today, Goodall devotes virtually all of her time to advocacy on behalf of chimpanzees and the environment, it says travelling nearly 300 days a year. In the doco, which was released in 2017, she said that since October of 1986, she hadn't been in one place for more than three weeks. Since 1986. Wow. I, I would assume that more current events might have uh, slowed down her <laughs> travel a little bit, but she is 87 years old that does now. does sound a little bit like she is uh, on the run from some chimps. <laughs> some chimps, uh, she owes some chimps some money. <laughs> yeah. 
bananas. But she's 87 now. She's 87 and she's still just travelling, speaking at conferences, speaking at events. People are paying a lot of money to to see her speak. She's just, she just sees it as her life mission. Essentially, she sort of talked about how, like, she never wanted to be a scientist. She never wanted to be... She doesn't give a shit if the science community accepts her or not. She wanted to research the chimps. She got to do that. She became quite famous for it and then she was like, well, now I have to use this platform to make sure that future generations are better stewards, she said, than we have been, to create better uh, environment and to protect the environment the chimpanzees and other animals live in. And so she's 87, she's still doing that. It's amazing. She's written 26 books, 11 of which are children's books. She's been the subject of more than 40 films, has been the recipient of numerous honours around the world, including she's the Dame Commander of the Most Excellent Order of the British Empire. She's had the United Nations Messenger of Peace, the French Legion of Honour and the Benjamin Franklin Medal in Life Science. She's still kicking. She's 87, like I said, and she's still just campaigning and spending her life trying to, yeah, trying to fucking make the world a better place. She's incredible. And I do have a little fun fact for you as well. Oh, you've pre-decided, of course. But, well, okay. All right, fine. I've got a fact for you. You decide. So obviously she's, she's researched chimps for more than 60 years and she has stated that dogs are her favourite animal. What? <laughs> That is a oh. grim fact. Oh my. <laughs> Chips what are, you are doing? like, what the fuck? Come on! <laughs> and now they're going to rip off her face. Don't dog the chimps. <laughs> but yeah, like I said, there's like so much that you can go into into this incredible life. I just wanted to give a little bit of the early days, a bit more information into why she's uh, such a household name, why she's quite famous for what she's done. Um, but, yeah, there's like 40 films about her, lots of books. So if you're interested, there's definitely a lot more information out there. But I just thought, you know, I'd give you, a, I'd add a little meat to the bones because I didn't know a lot of that. I was like, yeah, she studied chimps. <laughs> about 6% meat. Yeah. <laughs> so there you go. That is my report on Jane Goodall. Great work, Bob. That was uh, it was great. To, I mean, obviously, as an amateur primatologist, I knew a lot of that stuff. And when I said earlier that uh, maybe the chimps were eating lorises, that was obviously a joke because they live on different continents. We all yep. got it. It was funny. Yeah, the primatologists funny. at home were laughing a very lot. Very funny stuff. I obviously don't just not know where lorises are from. <laughs> you know, that would be ridiculous. Um, but anyway, I really did enjoy that very much. It was like you were doing that report just for me, Bob. Dave came along for the Oh, great to be here. And I've also got to do the Simpsons fact check that we spoke about at the start of the episode. Oh, yes, please. Yeah. And I'm glad I looked it up because we were going to get tweets. Uh, it's from the episode <laughs> Simpson Safari. Uh, they visited chimpanzee sanctuary maintained by scientist Dr. Joan Bushwell, a parody of Jane Goodall. And oh, she's the okay. one who's hoarding diamonds. So it, is a, it wasn't her voice. That is from season 12. So past there the prime. Go. <laughs> Only just that feels like it's so far past the prime. That's a yeah. real. That's a bit of a cliff. That's the kind of episode you're like, oh, they've got silly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I thought that happened later, but it happened pretty quick. Slippery slope. Well, now it's time for everyone's favorite part of the show: the fact, quote, or question. And and really, it's it's a broader thing than that. It's where we get to thank our supporters, who are the, the ones who keep the show running. They keep the lights on here. They've supported the show, uh, some of them for a number of years. And if it wasn't for them, really, this podcast and this little podcast network would not exist. So uh, we love to take the time to give them all a big shout out and a thank you. Firstly, we go through the fact, quote, or question section. And this has a little jingle. I think it goes something like this. Fact, quote, or question. Ding. Always remembers the ding. Uh, and to get involved in this one, you sign up on the Sydney Scheinberg Deluxe Memorial level, rest in peace, on uh, patreon.com slash do go on pod or do go on pod.com. And uh, on this level, you get pretty much all the rewards. It's one of the top levels. You get the bonus episodes. Uh, you get voting rights in two of the three weeks. Like today's episode by Jess, you would have voted on that. 
and all sorts of other things. You get uh, there's a Facebook group exclusively, which is really fun. There's a bunch of uh, supporters in there who do their own things occasionally. There's uh, snack swaps, international snack swaps. At the moment, one of our patrons is doing this uh, great thing where he's doing every day. He's putting together a playlist based on um, supporter suggestions on a certain topic. Been a lot. Look, I got to tell you, it's a lot of fun in there. <laughs> um, but this one, the fact, quote, or question section, you get to give yourselves a title and also give us a fact, a quote, or a question. First up, this week we've got Jeremy Swade, who's got, it can't be real, that name, can it? Oh, that's a cool name. Yeah, it's a beautiful name. Jeremy's given himself the title of Senior Executive Chancellor to the Land of California. <laughs> Great. Okay. Great to have the Chancellor on board. <laughs> and Jeremy's offered us a fact, and this is his fact. The highest and lowest points in mainland United States are both in California. Mount Whitney stands at 14,495 feet, and less than 100 miles away is Death Valley, which is 282 feet below sea level. That is cool. Yeah. For such a massive, massive, like, you know, mainland country. Wow. Yeah. Death Valley's a great name. Is it? It sounds pretty scary to me. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Jess, is that a fun fact or? Uh, I'd say it's pretty fun. Well, got the tick of approval there. Jeremy, thank you so much for that fun fact. Uh, the next one comes from Eric Espen Niergaard Jacobson. And he has given himself the title of Head of All Things Concerning Bricks, Hunting and Cooking. <laughs> okay. It's quite a big portfolio. It is actually, yeah. Bricks. Hunting. Is he hunting? Is he hunting with bricks? Because that sounds awful. Bricks. And then is he cooking what he hunted? <laughs> that that's one of the tools that they've found some um, non-human primates using is rocks. They'll use a flat rock and then another rock to crack open uh, crab shells and stuff. And they've said that's another um, sign that I, I don't know if they were chimps or what, but they were going through the the Stone Age basically, which is pretty fascinating. Oh, they moved on from the Stick Age. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> It's a, it's, a, it's a modern telling of uh, the three little pigs. Uh, <laughs> stickage kind of makes me want to say stickage and that feels like something that Paulie Shaw would say. <laughs> <laughs> Munching on some stickage. stickage. <laughs> uh, so Eric's given us a quote and here it is. Well, it have, vaguely relevant to, uh, to Jane's favourite animal. Uh, the quote is, there's many ways to beat a dog. My old boss used to say this when explaining a job could be solved in different ways. Nowadays, I say it whenever I get the chance. There's many ways to beat a dog. <laughs> that is a grim quote. Is it like a play on many ways to skin a cat? I guess I think so, yeah. Why have I never had a problem with skin a cat but beat a dog? I'm like, what the fuck? But does it mean beat a dog like assault a dog or does it mean like outsmart and Beat yeah. a dog at a game yeah. or something. Yeah. Yeah, like there's that famous picture, I think it's a photo, of dogs playing poker. Yeah, many ways to beat dogs at poker. <laughs> yeah, you have a strong strong bluff yeah. or just a strong hand. Yeah. There's two. Or teach when you're teaching the dogs how to play poker, teach them the wrong rules. <laughs> yeah, teach them bad technique. Teach them that they've got to tell you what they're holding. Yeah. So there's three <laughs> there's different eight, ways. There's three right off the bat. Right off the bat. <laughs> we didn't even have to think hard about that. And if it's the other way, you could beat a dog with a bat. So, you know, <laughs> there's options either way. Many ways to beat a dog. I've been listening to Roy and HG lately and they were talking about how New Zealand, the New Zealand rugby team pulled out of the, the third test against Australia and they'd already won the series 2-0. And Roy's like, honestly, they must be thinking like, if it, playing Australia is like kicking a dog, you know? <laughs> It's a bit of fun for a while, but after, <laughs> but eventually you're like, why am I kicking this dog? <laughs> it's a bit of fun for a while, sure. That's very good. People don't know they're uh, they're a comedy duo. They're playing characters of uh, sports commentators. Anyway. Thank you so much for that quote, Eric. Um, <laughs> there's many ways to beat a dog. Maybe it'll catch on here. I'm not sure. I don't think it will. Uh, next one comes <laughs> from Jacob Giron, or Giron, uh, whose title is Lead Detective Who's Cracked the Case of Matt's Auburn Auburn Locks. Uh, Genetics. Brackets. I've cracked it too. Surprisingly, 
He borrows it. Oh, from your jeans? <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> and uh, Jacob's got, uh, given us a question. And his question is... What are your jeans? <laughs> <laughs> how, do I get, how do I get them? <laughs> What's the... Yeah. How, how, how do I... Where are they? Are you ever not looking at them? <laughs> if you go away at some point, let <laughs> me know. Where do you leave your jeans? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, What's a combination to your safe where you put your jeans? Your jeans safe. Uh, Jacob wants to know, is there an episode that sticks with you after all these years? He's answered the question, but I'll... Love I'll... that. Thank you for answering the question. Um, uh, I always, when people say, like, what's sort of like a, a weird topic you've done or what's your favourite episode, I always say... Burials, death burials <laughs> and all that. Yeah, honestly, <laughs> that sticks with me years later because I'm never going to get uh, open casket all these yeah, years later. Yeah, definitely not. That's but, like, true. I haven't listened to that for a very long time and that was coming up to five years ago. Or was it over five years ago? Yeah, coming up to six, I think. Fucking hell, it was so long ago. Um, but it's still, like, it is still stuck in my head, like packing cotton in your asshole. D.B. <laughs> Cooper, I think, like, sticks in my head a bit too. D.B. Cooper, that was a great ride. I remember that for a long time that was one I always recommended, but now I hardly remember the story. But yeah. I do remember being on that journey not knowing anything about it. That was a really good one. There was another one. What was the one, Jess, that you told about a, a, a mystery of a killer and there was a twist at the end and I, you'd sort of given it away earlier. <laughs> Maybe that they were caught and I didn't realise. So I was like, what? Yeah. He left. Yeah, maybe it was the the Golden State. Or maybe. The, or the, what was it, GSK or something? B- BTK. BTK. It was one of those ones that I remember was like, whoa. The one one that I, I mean, there's a bunch of the reports that I do myself because you're, you're not just with it for two hours, you're with it for a week or so beforehand. Yeah. Like the, uh, the Watergate one I found really fascinating to learn about. Or the uh, the stranger in the woods, or whatever that episode yeah. was called. Yeah, that one I remember. Just like it, it felt like it was my whole life for a little while. It was all I could think of. I dreamt about it. Mm. Um, so those ones uh, still come back into my head every now and then as well. Uh, one I think about is a live one I did maybe three years ago now about uh, Donald Crowhurst, who's the guy that entered that uh, yacht race to win lots of money and oh, then yeah. yes. started lying about. <laughs> where he was out of desperation, <laughs> so hoping funny. he could catch up later. And yeah, I just think about yeah his desperation a lot. I just think about that. It's just such a wild story. Yeah. And yeah, when you tell one little lie, it's it's interesting when you you can get yourself into a situation, never that full on, but where you you think something matters way more because you're too close to it. Yeah. yeah. So you start behave like you you take risks and you you may maybe you. Um, uh, you get in too deep into something. I can't think of an example, but I reckon I've had that feeling before. Yeah. Where I like, if you a few weeks later, you're like, "Wow, that didn't matter at all. <laughs> Why yeah, were you yeah. even?" <laughs> but that would have been like the same for him. Him. Oh, you could just not win this race, and yeah, that that's would probably right. be better. Although maybe this is this was better in the end. Um, anyway, the one that I think may still I'm in danger of laughing whenever I think about is the. Um, it was a bonus episode about the 1904 Olympic marathon. Oh my god! <laughs> yeah. And where the, the wild dogs like I can't talk about it too much because I will. But funnily enough, Jess, I was uh, to put up a vote, my recent vote or my vote for next week. I was going through old votes to see if any close second places came up, and I'd put that up for a vote one time. Really? And I obviously didn't look into it much. I don't even remember putting it up for the vote, but. I almost did it as like a, a main feed episode at one point. I wonder if I would have found it as funny. It was the hardest you've ever laughed. Yeah, so hard. It was the best. I, actually, at one point, though, I was concerned you were not getting enough air in. Oh, it was dangerous. It was dangerous. Yeah, I was it like, was oh, this stuff. is really fun and infectious and we're all having a laugh. I am a bit worried, actually. It's funny. <laughs> someone someone said they listened to it at one point and were disappointed that the laugh wasn't that long. And then I remember that. Um, you edited it down. Yeah, I cut a couple of minutes out. Because <laughs> it's a bit, you can't just listen to someone laughing for no, minutes. it's tedious. Yeah. I cut, yeah, I cut quite a lot of laughter out. That's so fun. We should one day release the uh, <laughs> the director's cut. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a great question. Thanks for taking us down memory lane, Jacob. Jacob answered saying, I constantly go back to the D.B. Cooper episode oh, yeah. to play in the background while I'm working around the house. And I cry laughing every time Matt says, 
Slow Chef is Slow Chef. Does that make any sense to you guys? Oh, yeah. One of the... Oh, uh, Florence? Yeah, Florence Schaefer, I think, was the uh, the steward on board. He was really brave. But we, we called her Flow Chef. <laughs> God, we're the worst. <laughs> we're such dicks. <laughs> Who the fuck would listen to this? We're terrible. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jacob, who obviously does listen to this. Uh, Please, keep listening. <laughs> Please keep listening. Uh, and finally this week from Paloma Velasquez, uh, who's given himself the title of Was Spooky Vicar, Now Spooky Vicar 2, The Spookwill. <laughs> I like a spookwill. That's spookful. fun. And Paloma's also asked a question, which is, which of the following comedy place names is the funniest? Okay. Oh, <laughs> Cucamonga. Oh, my God, Dave. <laughs> is that on there? That is one of the four options. Yeah. Okay. Seattle? Is Seattle? <laughs> oh, okay. So you know this quote, I'm guessing. I don't know what it's from. <laughs> Which of the following comedy place names is the funniest? Walla Walla, Keokuk, Cucamonga, or Seattle? <laughs> What's that from? Oh, The Simpsons, where uh, Homer goes to the clown college and Krusty's like, remember these funny place names? <laughs> 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 <It's> <laughs> Seattle. <laughs> <laughs> and then Homer's like, you're killing me. You're killing me. <laughs> I got to say Cucamonga. I got to say a, Walla Walla. Yeah. No, that's, that's funny. That's pretty much Fuzzy Bear's uh, catchphrase, isn't it? From uh, the Muppets, didn't you have a yeah. catchphrase that was something like that? Like that. Waka waka. Oh, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, they're, they're all our fact quotes for questions. Like I say, if you want to get involved in those, go to the uh, Sydney Schoenberg level at patreon.com slash do go on pod or do go on pod.com. We also thank a few of our other great supporters. Uh, Jess normally comes up with a game that has something to do with the episode. Yes. So, um, seeing as we are primates ourselves, human beings, what we're going to do is hunt and eat smaller primates. <laughs> Nah, just kidding. Um, <laughs> so each one we're giving a different smaller primate to eat. Is that the idea? Yes. What primate would they eat? Great. I'll, I'll pull up a list of uh, great uh, cutie pie primates that we oh, can no. feast on. <laughs> no, not the cutie pies. <laughs> no, only Uggos only. <laughs> um, um, okay. Maybe like the night monkey. <laughs> it's a pretty un- ugly monkey, I think. What Only go be? out at night for a reason. What about, you know, what they're an animal expert on? Yes, 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 yes. They've pioneered the field. Okay, great. Okay, great. Well, and then also I... what smaller animal they like to devour and eat. <laughs> Maybe I'll <laughs> save that for like the uh, the trip ditch club. <laughs> Hunting. What, what are you serving up? Smaller primates. All right, if I could kick it off, I'd love to thank from Randwick in New South Wales, Australia, Andy Hales. Andy Hales is, of course, uh, one of the leading experts in the study of the behaviour of the pufferfish. Oh, oh. Yeah. fantastic. Yeah, pufferfish, yeah. they really make me laugh. <laughs> Do they, Dave? Yeah, when they puff up, they just look so funny. <laughs> was, it, was it the pufferfish in The Simpsons where the... Um, the head chef. Oh, Fugu. He had to step out. Maybe he was having an affair or something. And then the apprentice chef had a go and got Homer sick and he was almost going to die. He thought he was going to die. That's right. Yeah, I think that is actually a thing. Is a Yeah. Fugu is a poisonous fish that's also very tasty. Would you take that risk? No. <laughs> On the way, you've got 50-50 chance. You might have a real nice dish or die. <laughs> 50-50, toss of the coin. I'm also not big on fish, so yeah, right, it's a, that right, would yeah. easily make the decision for me. <laughs> well, I've Googled a puffer fish and I'm laughing over here. This is very funny. <laughs> I uh, sort of feel like they're, like, they're quite defensive, you know? <laughs> I know it's not a defence thing, it's like a fear thing, I think, that makes them all puff up, but it, it makes me think of a defensive person to be like, oh, well. Oh, oh. I'd also love to thank from address unknown, have to assume from <gasps> deep within the lair of the mole people. Oh, my goodness. And I, for one, would like to say that I what do you, <laughs> respect our uh, new mole leaders. Yes, our overlords. <laughs> uh, from the mole, Valley of the Moles, it is Kim Forsgren. Kim Forsgren, of course, uh, an expert in alligators. Uh Oh, yeah, that's good, fantastic. yeah. yeah. Uh, one of the few people on earth who can uh, 
tell the difference between an alligator and a crocodile. Right, One of the, yes. one of the few. So in documentaries, they, <laughs> they're frequently... <laughs> <laughs> You'd normally edit out something like that, but, I mean, that was pretty good. <laughs> watching, watching someone try not to sneeze in a Zoom window is very funny. <laughs> and then sneeze way louder than if they just fucking sneeze. <laughs> Idiot. No, I'm going to give Kim their time in the sun. Kim's one of the few people that can tell the difference. So constantly on documentaries, Kim's getting calls to be like, hey, I'm going to send you a couple of photos. Can you tell me, is this an alligator or a crocodile? We're going to look like idiots without you, Kim. Yeah, even uh, uh, Steve Irwin used to <laughs> phone him up sometimes. <laughs> so that shows just how much respect. Steve uh, Irwin's describing him. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's sort of like quite long. Uh, <laughs> bit it's like green. Its, its neck goes all the way down to its tail. Yeah, <laughs> uh, looks a bit like a crocodile. Might be a crocodile. I'm not sure actually. It's got teeth. Quite a lot of them. <laughs> it's coming towards me quite quickly. <laughs> Kim's like, can you get can you get a closer look? <laughs> And finally from me, I'd love to thank from Lantwit Major uh, in Great Britain, it is the great Robert Raw Collings. Raw. Raw, you absolute legend. I love you, Raw. What do you reckon What do you reckon Raw's an expert in? Raw, I got that name from being an expert in... <laughs> Dogs, Raw Doggin. Raw. <laughs> <laughs> Dog expert. Speaking of uh, contraception oh. earlier. That's right. <laughs> All right. Let's make a call. Is that editing yet? Nah. <laughs> raw dogging. We love you raw. We love you raw and you love to raw dog. <laughs> no, well, that's how we got the nickname. It was an ironic nickname. He's just an expert in Welsh dogs. Welsh which... dogs, yes. Uh, dogs native to Wales. Was that a corgi or something? I love corgis. They have the cutest little butts. <laughs> and they look so smiley. I met a corgi the other day whose name was Kibble. That's cute. Corgis cute. are Welsh dogs, Dave. How do you know that? Because they're Welsh corgis. Oh. <laughs> There's also <laughs> Welsh terriers and Welsh sheepdogs. There you go. I didn't Raw, know that about. Hey, uh, Raw knows them all. If you yeah. want more info, you can call yeah. him. Oh, or just go to his website, rawdoggin.com. <laughs> Uh, do not go to that website. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, that, that's they're the three for me. Anyone else want to have a go? Thanking a few of our great supporters. I'll oh, I'll take it from here. Oh, fuck. <laughs> I would love to uh, chime in and thank from Hawthorne East in Victoria, Eliza Knox. Oh, from the what? affluent East. What's she knocking on? <laughs> but you get that a lot, Eliza, and it's probably very annoying, so I'm very <laughs> sorry about that. Eliza is, of course, leading expert in the study of seals. Oh, yes. There have been seals in the river near Hawthorne East recently, Hawthorne, <laughs> Abbotsford kind of area. She's not a worldwide uh, expert, but in the Hawthorne area she has had a look and as such... No, I'm just saying that's why she's moved to the area. Oh, right. Okay, she's a she's she's a seal chaser. Yeah, I mean, it's not that she's often in the seal club that a seal is in the Yarra. Yeah. So it's a big deal. It's not often that anyone would swim in the Yarra. Yeah, it's gross. <laughs> Did you know that my uh, my dad's uncle actually was a seal expert? Whoa. Your dad's uncle. Yeah. So my great uncle, uh, grandpa's brother, Ross. No, not Ross Warnke. What's his name? <laughs> Close, Can't remember his first name. Low yeah, respect. <laughs> <Lower respect. laughs> he lived down there, um, lived down near Phillip Island and there was a Warnicky hut was a thing out there oh, that he would cool. study, study them from. And then that's cute. Uh, <laughs> this is ridiculous. But if, a couple of years ago uh, the ABC had a show where um, they used all this old found footage and then um, dubbed the voices over like um, they made new documentaries out of old documentaries in a, in a comedic way and they had vision of my dad's uncle because my dad was a fan of the show and he was also like, oh, my God, that's my <laughs> That uncle. would have blown your mind. Yeah, wow. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Um, that's great. Who else Who else we got here to thank? Oh, I would love to uh, keep the love going for Aaron Nodstrom Young from Calgary, Alberta. Aaron, thank you so much for your support. An expert in what are those little little insects that have like a glowing t glow worms? 
<laughs> what are those little glowing. worms that glow? Yeah, and the caves in the New Zealand caves, uh, little glow worms there. Beautiful. In that. That's good fun. I've forgot, I've, have you guys gone on one of those little caving things, see the glow worms? No, I was going to go to New Zealand this year and that we'd already bought tickets to that. Uh, oh, it was so good. Yeah, I'm keen to go back. I, had, I bloody love New Zealand. Hey, you guys up for doing a, a live show in New Zealand? <laughs> yeah, we're, yes. we're, 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 we're not allowed to leave our house. We were absolutely. genuinely talking about it because we, we, there was so much hope about the, the trans-Tasman bubble. Yeah. And our our part of that has rarely been open. <laughs> not for long yeah. enough to be able to plan a trip and then actually do the trip. But, Yeah. So keen to get over there. Oh, that's a that's a good one for. So that was for Aaron, was it? The glow worms. When I was a kid, I had a little glow worm toy. Do you remember them? You'd no. hold it near the light. You'd get dad would hold it near the light before oh. bed, and then it would glow for a while overnight. I don't really know how that works. That's but, cute. You yeah. had a night light, essentially. What you had? Yeah, I was like a little bitch baby. Scared the dark. No, I wasn't a baby. I was about 17. <laughs> Dad, Dad, can you hold it up Dad. against the light? I'm taller than him by then. <laughs> Dad, tuck me in. <laughs> yeah, but Dad, I'm already in bed. I'm already cozy. Is that called me, glow please. bugs or something? Anyway. Yeah, that's a vaguely ring a bell. I didn't have one. I'd love to thank now from Tura Beach in New South Wales, Jordan Theobald. Jordan. Uh, what about an expert expert in jaguars? Oh, that's a cool one. That's good. I was that's thinking great. bulls with Jordan, but jaguars are even cooler. Yeah, such cool animals. Very cool animals. Very fast. And they're often they're often sort of spotted in the hills outside of Melbourne, supposedly. Mm. <laughs> well, that's Jordan. Sitting Jordan knows all about that. <laughs> there you go. Go scare some Melburnians. Thank you, Jordan. Um, I'd love to thank some people, if I may. I would love for that to happen so I much. I would love to thank from Milton in Queensland, Mick McConnell. Oh, my man, Mick. Mick. That's cool. You were hanging out with Mick recently, weren't you? I was, yeah. Last time I was allowed out, I was up in Brisbane. That must uh, I, saw, nice. I think I hung out with Mick like three times. We started at uh, the last um, show I did up there. It was at SBC Comedy. I reckon about 12 people hung around after and we started a stout club where we just ordered all the stouts at the bar <laughs> and we all just tried them all out. Stout club, the inaugural stout club. We haven't <laughs> been able beautiful. to get back together for a second stout club but one day. One day. Mate, don't talk about stout club. Oh, that's actually, first yeah, rule. Sorry. Um, All right. Well, no, the first rule is you got to drink stout but. Oh, yeah, because second rule, don't talk about it. Because it's you tedious. <laughs> we're hanging out with Mick so recently. Like when you're in Mick's presence, what kind of animal do you get the vibe of? Uh, squid. He often squid. He was talking about squid ink beer quite a bit. So okay. I reckon, I reckon he, he'd be a squid expert. Cool. That's cool. They're amazing creatures. They're fascinating, yeah. Great. Well, thank you, Mick. Um, I would also love to thank from uh, unknown location, <gasps> destination unknown, I would love to thank Tom Tithcott John. Uh, also wow. known as <laughs> Blob. You know, he's got a <laughs> kind of go with fancy names. So he'd have like a. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, did I read something wrong? What have I done? I'd forgotten the entire report I just read. <laughs> And your love for grub. Grub, so fun. <laughs> uh, what about an expert on beavers? Oh, yes. <laughs> That's normally your role, Dave, but we'll pass that on. <laughs> Self-appointed. <laughs> We've seen no proof they of any knowledge. Speaking of animals that make me laugh, though, honestly, you see a beaver like in, in a, trying to build a dam, dragging oh, a stick so long, cool. log along. So funny. So funny. Beavers are great. Big beaver fan myself. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Fantastic selection there for Tom Tithcott John. Fantastic. Uh, finally, Jess, who we got to thank? I would love to thank from Mount Lake Terrace, Western, I oh know, I was going to say Western Australia, but it says US. Washington? Stop you, Washington. I would love to thank David Hyun. 
David Hewn from Washington. I'm fascinated. Mount Lake Terrace. That sounds made up. I love but it. But it also does. sounds like he's just out on his porch looking at wildlife, being an yeah. expert. Yes. Yeah, big time. And that is in the Pacific Northwest. So I think David is an expert in Bigfoot. Oh, <gasps> he's a Bigfootologist. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Mount That's Lake awesome. Terrace just sounds like paradise to me. Yeah. It sounds fancy AF. Yeah, it sounds like there's a big <laughs> mountain and a lake nearby. It just sounds beautiful. Yeah, sounds really nice. It'd be so funny if he's like listening, laughing his head off because he's like, it's a shithole. <laughs> 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 he's like, you guys know nothing. <laughs> I'm sure that's not the case. It would just be kind of funny. No, I'm looking at pictures. That's exactly how I'm picturing it. <laughs> anywhere, anywhere that has terrace in it is going to be nice. The beautiful lake. Oh, it looks lovely. Yeah. Gorgeous. Thank you so much. Your Bigfoot knowledge. Let us know if you have any big breakthroughs. Get a, a, a photo or whatnot. So thank you yeah. to David, Todd, Michael, Jordan. <gasps> Michael Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> Aaron, Eliza, <laughs> Raw, Kim and Andy. Thank you so much for your support. The last thing we need to do is thank a few of our great long-term supporters and welcome them into the Triptych Club. These supporters have been on the shout-out level or above for the last three years straight and we welcome into the Triptych Club. Um, it's a lifelong pass. Once you're in, you're in for good, uh, if you want to be. And <laughs> <laughs> uh, the way this normally works is I'm standing at the door. I've got the clipboard. I've got your name on the list. I'll read out your name. Dave will hype you up, make you feel right at home, and then Jess, just to make Dave feel good, will hype Dave up a little bit as well. But Jess is also behind the bar, and she's normally worked on a little cocktail or a little hors d'oeuvre sometimes. Uh, but it's normally based on the topic. Yet you got anything going today, Bopper? Yeah, we we are going to hunt and kill smaller primates. Okay, yes. great. <laughs> so we're going to have uh, babies, baby, <laughs> baby primate hors d'oeuvres. That should be delicious. That should be fun. And drinks wise, um, all banana themed. Ooh, banana daiquiris. Is that <laughs> yeah, a thing? banana daiquiris. <laughs> yep. And Dave, you normally book a band. Who have you got for us this week? Uh, we have a band that uh, you're going to love these guys. They're called Part Chimp. They're an English uh, rock brand, uh, rock band, also brand, uh, from Camberwell, London, uh, formed in the year 2000. Um, the Wikipedia entry here is, says, Part Chimp have a reputation for sounding extremely loud. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. <laughs> so, looking forward to that. They are an alternative rock, noise rock slash sludge metal band. Oh, they sound great. I'm going to look them up. They sound fun. Uh, Hot champ. All right. So there's only four inductees this week, Dave. You ready to go? Oh, four, 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 four. Here we go. Okay. <clears throat> four. My fantastic four. Yeah. All right. Well, you do sound ready to go. Firstly, from Loughton in Essex, Great Britain, it's Michael Daly. Ooh, I'm going to thank you daily. Yes, Michael. From, oh, no kidding, from Brisbane in Queensland, Australia, the guy who runs the comedy night I was just talking about before, it's Cameron Silk. Ooh, this night's going to be silky smooth. Yes. If you're in Brisbane, go to the SBC Comedy Night. From Kingsport in Tennessee in the United States, it's Emily Baysdorf. Ooh, uh, you are my king sport. Yes. Ooh, <laughs> oh, it's like chess, a oh, sport for the, kings. What about the only 10 I see? Yeah, oh. all right. <laughs> and finally from Chicago in Illinois, United States, it's Zoe Roberts. Oh, let's get Illinoisy. Yes. Dave, you didn't even need me this week. <laughs> Thank you, but honestly, I couldn't have done it without you. Well, oh, no, you and you must, you must never do it without me, yeah. but you didn't even need me. Thank you so much for your long-term support, Zoe, Emily, Cameron and Michael. Um, Dave, do you want to boot this baby home? Hey, thanks so much for everyone that supports us on uh, Patreon and uh, on dogoonpod.com. You make our lives. That's you true. make our lives. You make our lives. Uh, so honestly, you know, we do appreciate it a lot. If you want to join them, of course, go to dogoonpod.com to get all of the bonus episodes and rewards that we talked about. One of the uh, most recent bonus episodes that I... Uh, just put out very recently was on the Dave Matthews Band Chicago River Incident where uh, a Dave Matthews Band tour bus uh, emptied its septic tank uh, on a bridge whilst a sightseeing open 
the river boat was passing underneath. So it was probably our most disgusting episode ever. <laughs> so if you want to check Beautiful. that out, as well as I think about 117 other bonus episodes, you can do that right now. Do go on pod.com. We can also find links to contact us, suggest a topic, uh, buy some merchandise, and yeah, get into our social medias at do go on pod as well. But until next week, I guess we'll say thank you so much for listening. And until then, I will say goodbye. Later. Bye. Bye.